Hello and welcome to a special show um, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Sharon and Stoughton. Um, this one is um, really interesting and timely. Um, and we have uh, as our guest Donna Cohen, all the way from Portland, Oregon. Um, we're going to be talking about the first, the first show, which is. Um, entitled Misinformation, Fake News, and Political Pro Propaganda, which I think is uh, very timely uh, for what we've all gone through uh, with the no uh, November 8th uh, elections. Um, welcome, Donna. Hi, Roy. Thanks How very you much. You're um, welcome. So, yes, I'm, I'm out here in Portland. I have a group called Civics for Adults, and I do <laughs> workshops usually through libraries uh, and sometimes through the League of Women Voters. And I appreciate that Stoughton and Sharon Libraries and the Friends of the Libraries and the League of Women Voters have invited me over the next few months to do uh, my set of four workshops. Um, just as an aside, I was born and raised in Boston, so I have a, a, a real connection with, uh, with this part of the country. Um, I actually have some slides that reflect uh, all four of the workshops that I do so that you can get a little bit of a taste of what's coming up. I developed these because, uh, number one, I saw a need for more civic literacy and critical thinking skills. Uh, I am a former teacher and librarian, so I felt it was within my wheelhouse, and it was just something that I felt moved to do. So I think I'll, I'll uh, start with some slides here, Roy, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, that's fine. We can uh, start with your slides and also uh, uh, start to describe the, uh, the first uh, show. Okay, so the slides are not, are not in order, uh, starting with the first one. Uh, so if you want me to jump to that, I can do that. Do you want me to... Uh, reorder these to start with the last one, which is the first workshop, that is? Well, um, I, I would say that um, uh, if we can just get into uh, the meat of, of what the first one is, uh, the misinformation, fake news, okay. and political propaganda, let's get into that and not worry too much about your slides. I think your information will more than cover that. Okay. Well, let me let me draw right down here to that slide. Okay, and I will share that. So this is uh, often the first workshop that I start with because it really is key to everything else. Uh, cr critical thinking is so <laughs> important and it's something that um, I don't know that we're teaching it in schools now. It just seems to be something that people uh, appreciate getting some um, some information, sometimes in the form of reminders of people forget what to do to think critically. So I cover in the workshop all of these areas. You can see there's quite a few of them from social media to propaganda. We look at surveys and poll questions and economic data and graphs and charts. Information is presented to us in so many different ways and people kind of forget about the pitfalls for different types of information that we're constantly receiving. And one thing that I like to um, say is that a claim without substantiation is just an opinion. So this is something that underpins a lot of what I talk about, which is that we seem to have forgotten that it's not enough just to say something is so, that to make a claim, to put out something as though or a fact, if we can't substantiate it, it really is just an opinion. And so, so I'm, I, uh, on social media, I can be a, a kind of a pest at times where I will point out to people when they post things, well, okay, this is fascinating information, but 
I'm not going to do anything with it unless you can show me where the source of that information is. So this is something that that is an important principle. Another principle is looking at information and deciding whether you have sufficient information to make a decision about something. So oftentimes we get part of information or information that's out of context and that is insufficient and we have to stop long enough to ask ourselves, you know, is there more that we need to make a decision? So there is a concept that has gotten fairly popular now about debunking or pre-bunking is something you might hear, which is how we can fortify ourselves against mis misinformation um, is by learning ahead of time what are the things to look for that are sort of the danger zones for information. Um, and that's what we do in the misinformation workshop. And it really prepares people, and, and it's been shown that, that really when people are, um, you know, have learned about what, what those red flags are, they're better able to deal with information. So, for example, uh, just a simple thing that can be done is if you see a headline or, or a social media post that just, you know, it, it, it creates a, a big emotional reaction in you, either positive or negative, the first thing to do is just stop. Don't send that thing off until you check it out. And if you read something that is big news, well, if it's big news, it's going to be everywhere. You're, you're not going to have any trouble putting some keywords into a search engine and finding a lot of articles and other information about it. And if you do that and nothing comes up, you can't find anything else, you know, anybody else talking about the information, that's a good indicator that maybe it's not true. So that's a really simple thing that people can do is just, you know, take the keywords, see if you can find somebody else talking about it. If not, that really is a tip off that it may not be may, may not be real. I talk about propaganda in the workshop and some of the strategies of propaganda, which really are quite similar to strategies of advertising and marketing. And uh, we're actually quite used to them and we don't realize that these very same strategies are used in propaganda. One thing we often don't think about with propaganda is the role of doubt. A really good example of that is, and, and I show a memo from the tobacco industry from quite a while back. After the government had determined that smoking was unhealthy for you, the tobacco industry just decided, well, they couldn't really just argue that it was healthful for you. That wasn't going to work. But they felt, and they actually wrote a memo in which they said, doubt is our product. In other words, if they could create in people enough doubt that, you know, maybe, maybe it wasn't that unhealthy. You know, maybe they're still learning about it. Uh, just enough to get people to question what, how serious it was, then people would continue to smoke, a lot of people, because smoking is an addiction. It's pretty hard to break an addiction, and so you really have to have a good reason, and thinking that you might die is a good reason. So doubt was their, was their strategy. Uh, another campaign where doubt was used a great deal is climate change. So for a number of years, you had um, groups that didn't want people to believe in climate change, just sowing doubt about what the scientists were saying. And it actually it worked quite well. We saw doubt being used in the 2020 election, doubt about uh, whether mail-in voting was, uh, was fraudulent, you know, was rife with fraud. And so that doubt was planted. And you can see in poll numbers that at the, in the early spring of 2020, Many more people thought there was no problem with mail and voting and, and felt that it was fine, a, a majority, good majority of people. And over the summer, as that campaign of mail and voting was bad, um, kept, kept being repeated, you saw the poll numbers show that people now started to doubt it. Now, I live in Oregon. We have had all mail and voting for 
a long time now and we love it. So we never got caught up in that because our experience showed us that it was fun. It is convenient too. It is so convenient. You know, I sit at my dining room table and I have all my materials about the election in front of me. If I have any questions, I'm just doing my research, very relaxed, and it's really a wonderful, wonderful approach. So it was interesting as an Oregonian. I, I um, think that, uh, Donna, if I might ask. Yes, uh, yes, by uh, all means. The president, for the former President Trump, uh, he started to so uh, send out uh, misinformation about voter fraud and all the bad things before the election was even held uh, a couple of years yes. ago. Yes. Uh, there's an awful lot of that propaganda going on. If you study, um, if you're a TV watcher and you watch CNN and compare it to Fox, there's, there's, they're totally different. But one of them, I, I believe, is, is really um, full of misinformation. So I think your, your presentation should be very, very interesting. Um, I have and, another uh, example, uh, I think one more slide here related to the misinformation workshop. I do cover a great deal of territory, which of course I can't show now because this is this is just a short interview, but I just thought I would highlight a few things to give a flavor. And that is economic data. So I've started to incorporate economic data into the misinformation workshop because when we talk about the economy and, and we know, you know how we view, quote, the economy de can determine how we vote. It can determine how we view political events and how we feel about uh, political policies. So um, I like to kind of point out that some of the measures that we now use to, dis to tell us whether we have a good economy. The measures, it's not that the measures are wrong, it's that they are incomplete. So as an example, we will hear, oh, our GDP is going up. We have good GDP, so the economy is good. Well, as this chart from the Federal Reserve shows us, there was a time that when GDP increased, so did people's incomes. <laughs> so to be able to say, wow, the GDP is improving, that's a good sign for people generally, was, it was valuable information. Now, GDP and people's incomes have really gone in different directions. So an improvement in GDP for a number of reasons, globalization, the financialization of our economy and so forth, to say that GDP is increased isn't necessarily saying the same thing as the economy is good for average people. So this is, you know, as I say, there's a great range of things that I discuss um, to kind of show where we need to be more alert, thinking more strategically and more deeply about the information that we come in contact with. What made you consider uh, putting out a series like these? I I'm interested in all these topics. And I just uh, saw a need, If actually, if I can go back to one of my earliest slides, which talks about civic literacy and, and democracy in general. How, how about if I do that? I'm just going to zip back here, right to the beginning. So in the Constitution workshop, the first thing I actually talk about, you can see the different topics, and it's, again, quite a range. I start by just talking about democracy in general and how uh, different groups like the Economist Intelligent Unit, Intelligence Unit, the Freedom House, uh, and so forth, measure democracy worldwide and how we, our country, and some other democracies have actually gone backwards. We're less democratic than we used to be. And I think that's really important for people to understand. And related to that, I talked a little bit about civic literacy and how how poor, unfortunately, in our country civic literacy is. So, for example, here you can see that as far as knowing the three branches of the federal government, 56% of folks know that. Actually, this is a big improvement in the last three years or so. It used to be about 35%. Unfortunately, the improvement is because of problems we've had in our country, but it has made people more aware 
of things like the three branches of government. Although, as you can see, we still have a lot of people that don't know that. So how do we make, in a democracy, it's all about us making decisions, right? It's, it's self-governance. How do we make decisions if we do not understand the basics of how our country and how our government and our how our political system works? And sad to say, there's somebody in Congress right now that does not know what the three branches of the federal government are. So that that's something that I just like to point out. But and they get that, they, yes. they keep getting reelected. And they keep well, yeah, and that has to do with gerrymandering, which I actually have a slide uh, related to that. If you if you'd like to see that, I'll just quickly go through these other slides that highlight a few aspects of the workshops. Shall I do that? Go ahead. So in the constitutional workshop, we go through the creation of the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the interpretation of the Constitution, and there, there are some real surprises there. So for example, the Bill of Rights, everybody just kind of takes that for granted. Well, the Bill of Rights, we wrote them and they applied to everything, you know, all our governments. And in fact, the Bill of Rights only applied to federal law when it was written. And it, it has taken centuries actually for to the point where most of it applies now also to state law. So for example, uh, you know, the First Amendment, freedom of religion. Well, if somebody is running for federal office, religion is not a, um, a qualification, right? You don't have to be of a certain religion. But for state offices, for many, many years, in fact, up until the 1960s, there were laws that said in various states that you had to be of a certain religion or you had to have a belief in God, just things related to a lack of religious freedom that was perfectly legal and was not against the Bill of Rights because again, the Bill of Rights only applied to federal laws. So little by little, individually, and in some cases, individual parts of the first 10 amendments were applied to state law um, as they say in 1960s when they said you know there can't be a religious test for either a federal or a state office so we go through the history and then we look in the last part a very very important and significant um, area of the constitution which is do we have a representative government if our government was meant to be representative do we in fact have that and we look at that from a number of factors. And just one very simply is, for example, in the House of Representatives, we started off with one representative representing about 50 to 60,000 people. We are now up to an average of one representative representing about 750,000 people. And you know, the founding fathers, the people who wrote the Constitution, there actually was, were, there were 12 amendments originally that was sent to the first Congress that they considered. Ten were passed. They're known as the Bill of Rights. But the, there was a first, the first First Amendment was not what we know as the First Amendment. The first First Amendment would have been one that said a representative or somebody in Congress cannot represent more than 50,000 people. So the frames of the Constitution, at, you know, at that time, they really thought that you can't have too many people that you're representing because then you can't be in touch with the people. So that's something, you know, for us to, to think about. Um, so we talk about this with the House, with the Senate. We talk about disproportionate in the Senate for other reasons as well. And we really just need to take a hard look at whether Congress is, um, is representing us uh, along these parameters. And if not, if we decide not, then what can we do about that? So, right. Well, Donna, let me, let me ask you this. Yes. Um, uh, we only have a short amount of time that we okay. can discuss this. And it sounds like you're giving away a lot of what you're going to discuss with your first presentation, Civics for Adults. Um, 
how long is each presentation? Half hour? No, each presentation is an hour, about an hour. And then we have about a half an hour discussion. And the discussion time is, is fascinating. It's, it's really wonderful to hear what people have to say and the questions they have and the sharing of ideas. So it's an hour of intense, uh, content-rich information related to each of the topics. And I'm sure that you get uh, some individuals who, are, who want to challenge you just for the sake of uh, proving that uh, they're, they're smart as you are. Well, <laughs> that does happen. But I have to say, in, in most cases, people are really quite pleased at, at what they've heard. And even folks who are really pretty well versed in a lot of this find something that's new to them, something they didn't realize, they didn't know, or maybe they knew it at one time and had forgotten it. And it's like, oh, I'm so glad to be reminded about that. So um, the feedback generally has been really, really positive. And uh, I mean, in one case, I will say it was kind of funny and it kind of tells me I'm, I'm really on the right track here. I did a constitutional workshop one time and during, at, at the end, Again, the vast majority of the audience was really pleased. There was one person who thought I was far too much on the right and one person who thought I was far too much on the left. So I sort of thought, okay, <laughs> I'm, I must be doing something right if, if, you know, these two folks just had totally different visions of what had happened. But everybody else was pretty satisfied. So um, not too much challenging. Okay. We... Um... Uh, each of your presentations are limited as far as the numbers of audience participation? Well, 60, that way we can have a discussion that's, you know, so sort of we can handle reasonably with, with that number of people. So you're limited to the first 60 people who uh, who uh, yes. seek uh, tickets. Uh, the, those are the ones that uh, you bring it in. Okay. Um, and Roy, could I just mention, uh, we don't have time to, to go look at any slides, but let me just mention what the other two workshops are, uh, especially because one of them is going to be then the one in um, January, <clears throat> and that is Citizen Activism 101. And in that workshop, we, we look at some historical issues with our com country, how we got through them. We look at a whole variety of ways to be engaged. A lot of people think, oh, I can either go out in the street and protest or I can run for office. And there's a slew of things in between to those two um, ends of the continuum. And then we also look at how to track uh, legislation in the Massachusetts legislature. We'll look at that. So, and how to go to your governing bodies and speak to them how to lobby, so a whole range of ways of being involved. And then the other workshop uh, is on elections and campaign finance, and we look at uh, many different aspects of elections and changes that we're seeing in how elections can be run, ranked choice voting, for example. We look at the history of voter suppression and voting rights. Uh, we look at campaign finance and then how you can get campaign finance information on candidates. So I just wanted to mention, you know, a little bit about those other workshops so people are kind of looking ahead to those too. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that um, there's uh, plenty of uh, places that you'll be able to uh, get your information for the for these uh, series of uh, uh, presentations that you're making. Um, where where are you going? To, where will the uh, presentations? be made where, where will you well be these doing? are going they'll be virtual now because again i'm in portland so and i started doing them virtually a couple of years ago because of covid covid and they've gone quite well I, oh let me mention that on my website and these are free to download for anybody i have comprehensive reading lists for each of the workshops at my website civicthinker.info under resources feel free to download them there's some really good information there. Repeat that, uh, your website again. The website is civicthinker, one word, civicthinker.info, yep. I-N-F-O. 
So www.civicthinker.info under the resources section. All right, that sounds great. Um, do you think that uh, the talks might uh, change how people look at the political system? The, the goal, the goal of my workshops, the goal of Civics for Adults is to um, increase people's knowledge and by demystifying a lot of things, help people to become more engaged. And I think that does happen. I had a woman took my activism workshop one time. She was toying with the idea of running for office, the school board. She took the workshop. She actually did run and win. And I've had people who have followed legislation and given testimony then on the state legislatures after taking my workshops. Um, so the, really the whole goal here is to get people to feel more comfortable about being involved because if we're not involved, we don't have a democracy. Okay. How, um, how much influence do you think the fake news uh, that, that people are, are being subjected to, um, how much uh, influence does, it, does the fake news have on the end results? On the end results, well, okay, that <laughs> um, I'm not sure about the end results, but um, well, there is an influence. I mean, I, I do believe that maybe the biggest problem uh, that we have in our democracy right now is misinformation, because you know, in a democracy, if we're making decisions, if if it's about self-governance. We have to make decisions based upon good information. So to the degree that we are subjected to misinformation, it makes it harder for us to have our democracy, right. which is why we really need to educate ourselves to deal with information properly. We need to encourage the uh, politicians. We need to hold them to account. We need to hold to account journalists and reporters. Uh, we need to speak up when we see misinformation or incomplete information. And um, and, I, and my experience is that in most cases, for example, reporters appreciate if you point out that there's something that was left out or, you know, could have been presented in a, in a, in a better way. Well, Donna, I, I've, uh, I appreciate you spending the time with us uh, to get the information out about uh, these very, very valuable uh, question and answer sessions that you're going to be conducting. Uh, this first one is going to be on uh, December 4th, Sunday night, 7, 7 o'clock on Zoom. Um, once you uh, re register, you'll get a link emailed to you um, that uh, will uh, get you into that uh, program. And re registration is limited to uh, the first 60 individuals. So sign up now. It sounds like a fabulous series, and the first presentation sounds really interesting uh, to the point where I think I would like to remember <laughs> to get into it. I want, I want to learn uh, what you have to say. Um, great. My, That's thanks, great. my thanks to the Stoughton and Sharon Public Libraries and their support groups, Sola and the Friends of the Sharon Library, for bringing this series to our residents at no, no cost. These are free. And thanks, Donna Cohen, for being with us today and for bringing this great series to Sharon in Stoughton. I wish you luck with it. And uh, please consider joining the Sharon Stoughton League of Women Voters. They're a nonpartisan and work hard to bring programs of interest to, to our towns. And lwvss.org is their website. That's, uh, I believe that's it for us. And uh, again, thanks for uh, spending the time with us, Donna. And uh, good luck. Thanks very much. And this is Roy Cohen saying thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.